My name is Fred Kuntz and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of our signature lecture series. Thanks also to, this, uh, to those joining us uh, through our live webcast. Following this evening's address, we welcome questions from either audience here in the auditorium at the microphones in the aisles, or else uh, if you're at home watching on your computer through the live chat function on your screen. Please remember to state your name and to keep your questions brief. It's one thing to learn about the changes and developments taking place in Asia by watching and reading the news, but to witness the progress firsthand with a clear view of the political arena is something completely different. Tonight, Ambassador Yosef Caron will share with us some of his experiences as Canadian Ambassador to the People's Republic of China and the Republic of India and the realities he witnessed that continue to shape the region's present and future. Here to introduce our distinguished speaker is CG Vice President of Programs, David DeWitt, who joined CG in 2011 and oversees the strategy and implementation of all of CG's research-related activities. David is from York University, where he's uh, on leave as a professor of political science, and he also served as a, as a director of the Center for International and Security Studies and the Associate Vice President of Research, Social Sciences and Humanities. Join me now in welcoming David DeWitt. Thanks, Fred, and welcome, everyone. Whoops, there we go. <laughs> Joseph Caron was a public servant for four decades. Interspersed with assignments in, the private, sec in private sector ventures, with responsibilities in Japan, China, Hong Kong, Korea, and Taiwan, his principal professional appointments were in foreign affairs and international trade, along with an assignment to the Privy Council office. In three consecutive appointments from 2001 to 2010, Mr. Caron became the, the only Canadian diplomat to date to have served as our ambassador to arguably the most significant Asian countries, China, Japan, and India. Prior to those very senior appointments, he was Canada's senior official, the Assistant Deputy Minister, responsible for our diplomatic and trade activities in Asia Pacific and Africa and the Middle East. He served as Canada's senior official for Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC, responsible for the participation of Canada's Prime Minister in those summits. He has served at the Centre of Canadian Trade and Diplomatic Activities, including in the Foreign and Defence Secretariat of the Privy Council Office under Prime Minister Trudeau, and over the years that followed in the G8 and in eight economic summits. Since retiring from the diplomatic service, Joseph Caron has also assumed corporate governance responsibilities. He is on the Board of Directors of Manulife Financial, whose Canadian division is located nearby, Kitchener-Waterloo, and on the Board of Vancouver International Airport. He also advises other firms on the promotion of their interests in Asia. A few years ago, while I was still at York, he received an honorary doctorate from the Schulich School of Business, and he maintains active involvement in both the Asia Pacific Foundation and the Institute of Asian Research at UBC. So much for the official biographical note. Let me add a few personal comments. I've known Joseph for about 25 years. During those years, I engaged him on issues ranging from Middle East politics to trade and development issues, and of course, the Asia Pacific. I often came as a supplicant from the university world, asking for advice or access or financial support for research initiatives. He was always generous, sometimes patient, but never too patient, and never without insight and well-informed suggestions. Most attractive, he was an example of someone who, through, through deep study, acute observation, intense personal experience, and hard work, offered remarkably astute analysis and observations, along with carefully considered opinion. More to the point, he was prepared to share that knowledge and wisdom with his colleagues, both inside as well as outside government. And he, 
always was candidly honest. Many of us benefited from Joseph's interest and support in our work. I had the good fortune to visit China and Japan a number of times, a few of those when Joseph Caron was our ambassador. Not only was he personally interested in my visit and the visit of my colleagues, he always made himself available and he would host small events with his own staff along with local academics and the occasional government official so that I could have the opportunity to learn from them. He was genuinely interested in not just policy and process, but in the world of ideas, including perspectives that might challenge his own, or at least those of the then government of Canada. His multiple assignments in Japan, his command of the Japanese language, of its history and its culture, and his commitment to Canada-Japan relations led Meiji University to bestow on him an honorary doctorate, a rather unusual recognition of a serving ambassador. And whether in Beijing, Tokyo, or Delhi, those of us who needed to be in touch with him always knew that be it, he'd be at his desk at 5 a.m. his local time, reading the international as well as local national press, usually in the language of the country, and catching up on world affairs, never far from email, phone, or Skype. It is truly a great pleasure to have Joseph with us and to invite him to address us this evening. Joseph, come on. Thank you, David. Uh, well, thank you, David, for this very generous um, introduction. I think it's also the longest I've ever received, so this is, this is great. Um, we all know that Montreal's playing uh, New York tonight, and uh, so I'm, uh, I'm amazed that you're all so brave as to come out here, and therefore I, I thought what I would do, given the sacrifice of the time, is I'd spend the next hour talking about uh, Chinese interest rates and the efforts to liberalize them. <laughs> But then I thought, uh, well, maybe that's not such a great idea. Uh, it's after 7 o'clock, after all, and you should be not only, I hope, uh, interested, but also, to some extent, perhaps, even entertained a bit. All right, believe it or not, at some point, the, uh, the title is going to show up. Actually, what I thought, uh, what I, thought I would do is um, I want to weave together a series of ideas. I, I ended up spending about 25 years in, uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, two-thirds of that in Japan, 17 years in Japan, but also, as, as you heard, uh, uh, in China and India. I was also in, uh, in Indochina, and all the way in Western Turkey, uh, in, uh, in Western Asia and Turkey. So what I thought I'd do is I'd weave together a set of ideas uh, that um, underpin my view that to understand uh, today's Asia, it's essential uh, to have notions that are both historical and uh, contemporary. I thought that what I should, uh, as I said, uh, was to weave a few of these ideas together, and we're going to be operating, obviously, given the time constraints and everything else, and the purposes of the evening, at a pretty high uh, level of abstraction, perhaps, uh, 30,000 feet. Uh, but what we're going to do this, we're going to do this in, in uh, Chinese airplanes and uh, Indian airplanes, uh, uh, the objective being to provide you as much as I can the perspective of, of the world in Asia from, uh, from uh, the region. Um, I'm going to talk about modern Asia, but um, uh, modern Asia is not just uh, modern. Um, the countries in today's Asian states draw important parts of their dynamism from an ever-present, uh, ever-vibrant and relevant past. Okay, now we'll see if this works. There we are. Um, we're Canadians, and we tend to see history as a pretty well a linear process. The past provides a social and technological impetus, but one that's largely irrelevant to the challenge of designing the next big thing. Can you think of how many Canadian prime ministers, for example, have publicly thought, you know, what would, about public policy issues, you know, what, what would John A. do about this? Uh, or how many of us think in those terms? We don't. But in, uh, in Asia, it is... Uh, the fact that the uh, past, both recent and distant, is much more alive. It's something to draw upon in order to, to take control and to design the future. 
Now, as everywhere else on the planet, uh, there are large countries in Asia and small ones, and they each have their own histories and social systems and, and perspectives. But the t larger ones, as again, everywhere else in the world, tend to exercise a much more gravitational pull because of their historical depth, the dimensions of their territories, and the absolute size of their populations, China and India have at various times exercised immense political and cultural influences well beyond their political space, indeed on supercontinental basis. Their 21st century potential, based on today's geography, demographics, and economic growth, will necessarily echo some of that past at home and uh, beyond their region. Now, ironically, uh, in order to address the Far East in those terms, I really have to start with, so to speak, the Far West. Uh, and we have to do this uh, because essentially from the age of exploration uh, to the first half of the 20th century, the broad lines and much of the plumbing of global power and its distribution were shaped uh, by the West. They were designed to meet uh, the West's needs and uh, our priorities. During the 18th, 19th, and first half of the 20th century, Western powers exercised extensive authority in, over China, parts of, Indonesia, parts of uh, Indochina, um, uh, parts of Southeast Asia. These societies were essentially governed from Paris and London and Amsterdam and Lisbon and Washington. In the process, and to serve their ends, these powers imposed many political, military, technological, legal, commercial, bureaucratic methods and institutions that were fundamentally foreign uh, to these societies. In many cases, these impositions were in direct and even offensive conflict uh, with prevailing social and political norms. Borders were redrawn to facilitate colonial uh, control and military priorities. Think of the French in Indochina. Kingdoms were overthrown or subordinated uh, by, uh, uh, to imposed elites. Uh, this is the case of the Dutch, for example, in, Indo in Indonesia. Local agricultural economies were forced to produce for distant metropolitan markets uh, instead of meeting local needs, sometimes leading to famines. British India in the 1940s had the Great Bengali Famine, uh, which may have led to the death of four million people under British rule. Long-held religious beliefs were challenged by alien creeds, uh, primarily Christianity. Organic urban communities were torn apart to make way for geometric city centers. And this was happening uh, literally all over uh, Asia. Now try to imagine what it would have been like to have been uh, this Qing Mandarin uh, official or perhaps an educator in the final years of the 19th century, witnessing the slow motion collapse of the Qing uh, uh, dynasty in the, in the face of this onslaught of westernization and military power. Almost every major foundation of Chinese thought and institutions were proving to be inadequate to counter the West or meet the evolving needs of the Chinese people. A 2,000-year-old governance uh, system, an imperial system, uh, uh, could not meet the challenges of the period. Traditional military strategy, tactics, supply systems, leadership uh, could not counter the West's power. A 1,200-year-old uh, elite educational system based on Confucianism had to be abandoned. The foundations of Chinese science, astronomy, chemistry, physics, even medicine had to be replaced with Western rationalism and the modern scientific method. Confucian value systems were fundamentally challenged by modern notions of political order and social equality, including for women, and equal rights before the law. Now, if you were an intellectual or a leader uh, facing all of this, how would you respond? Well, um, the Japanese, uh, for example, undertook a massive redesign of their governance, uh, their education system, their military, uh, along uh, Western lines. And they went beyond that, uh, uh, trying to better imperial powers by becoming imperialists themselves, eventually occupying and then annexing Korea, uh, Taiwan, initially northern China, uh, and ultimately about one-third of continental China. And then they went so far as to attack the United States. Well, we all know how that particular uh, experience ended. Um, Mao Zedong also borrowed from the West, 
Uh, he borrowed Marxism-Leninism uh, and uh, transformed it for Chinese purposes, uh, but his revolution required the obliteration of Chinese culture. And the Chinese traditional, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, Chinese great cultural uh, revolution of the 1960s and 70s were that as an objective. If you go to Beijing today, you don't see any of the re results of that uh, experiment. Every Asian civilization faced the same kinds of challenges, attempting to adapt to the essence of their societies and value systems on the one hand, with Western technology and economic uh, development on the other. Over time, uh, they also sought to meet and ultimately achieve an equal footing with the countries of the developed West. For example, in artistic terms, that's what you're looking at, they sought to combine Eastern and Western aesthetics, such as uh, you see in this New York apartment of Lady Aiko, who's a well-known Japanese, uh, Japanese uh, artist. And indeed, by now, in the 21st century, this amalgamation has largely been achieved, a set of parallel stories of adoption and adaptation. It's been going on for a century, but it has reached a dramatic crescendo as China and India progressively achieve their national objectives. Now, we in the West have never had to face such civilizational existential transformation. Of course, we've had revolutions, you know, famously in France and in Russia, in the United States, not in Canada, where we have peace, order, and good government, thanks to CG and University of Waterloo and, and others. Uh, we've had, of course, a succession of murderous and destructive wars. Uh, there have been massive transformations, such as uh, the Industrial Revolution. But we've uh, rarely been forced to deny and overthrow whole systems of philosophy, ethics, governance, education, social organization, science, uh, technology, as was the case forced upon them by time and circumstance uh, in Asia. In geopolitical terms, the, area, uh, the era was determined uh, by outside powers, largely the British Navy, and then following uh, World War II, the United States uh, Navy. To somewhat similar effect, Asia submitted to the global economic security system designed at Bretton Woods. However, um, Western dominance and control also contained within it the dynamic of its own progressive replacement. In other words, the Western order was ultimately beneficial not only to the West, but to Asia as well. For all of the injustices and injury uh, that Western powers brought upon Asian societies, these injustices are largely unknown to the vast majority of Westerners and largely unforgettable uh, to vast swaths of people in Asia. The West also provided uh, Asia with the tools that Asian societies have been able to add to their own toolkits to begin to affect changes of their own making in redesigning the world which we, our children and their children, will increasingly inhabit. Uh, now, these tools are ones that come immediately to mind. Market economy, modern science and technology, pragmatism uh, over ideology, meritocracy over hierarchy, rule of law over authoritarianism, public education for uh, the masses. Now, not all countries have accepted these in identical ways, but they've all adapted to uh, some extent. The result is that for the last 50 years in particular, we've been living a transformative era, one that is allowing the resurgence not only of once powerful, once dominant economies, but of what are powerful and proud civilizations. The West has won uh, in important ways in Asia. No country except North Korea contests the fundamental workings of the market economy, uh, even as they adjust the plumbing to meet their own ends. Many have become modern democracies. However, it's equally true uh, that at a profound level, nothing trumps culture. Seemingly against all odds, societies do preserve a lot of their DNA, uh, no matter how determined are the forces of change. Today in China, you have socialism with Chinese characteristics. We have Japan and Korea's distinctive takes uh, on the market economy. We see the continuing vitality of Malaysia's 30-year-old Look East policy. Uh, furthermore, uh, looking beneath the supermodern veneer of cities like Tokyo and Seoul and, 
uh, Singapore, for example, we can find the cultural and philosophical roots of civilizations that are as vital and relevant today as ever. For most of us, however, uh, this can be hard to make out when you're in, uh, in Tokyo or Beijing and surrounded by the Hyatt Hotel and, uh, and uh, clubs and Maseratis and what have you. Uh, if you can't watch local television and understand it in Chinese or Japanese or Bahasa, much of it uh, is missed. Just to give you a concrete example uh, of this, um, I often felt when I was High Commissioner in India uh, that uh, the biggest hurdle to understanding uh, India is the English language. Um, as an English-speaking foreigner, uh, you'd think that I'd have access to all of India, uh, tremendously articulate uh, Oxbridge-educated uh, edu uh, educated, uh, politicians and economists and intellectuals, writers, a plethora of English language newspapers, several 24-hour English language news stations, and so on and so forth. But I often felt uh, that the real India was elsewhere. I don't speak Hindi, and as it happens, more than half the Indian population doesn't speak Hindi either. There are currently 22 constitutionally authorized official languages in India, plus English as the language of national governance. A plethora of media appears in each of those 22. Regional and even national uh, debates are usually conducted outside the English realm. If you go to the Lok Sabha, for example, the parliament, uh, it's all very interesting. They don't have translation service, and it's most of the time in, and not in English, the vast majority of the time. Most people you meet in the street don't speak English. Perhaps some of you have tried to get a taxi or a, uh, a pedicab in Delhi, and uh, the driver doesn't speak English. And many of the elites outside Delhi and Mumbai and Calcutta don't speak English either. I say this to illustrate the point that even in a country seemingly so accessible as India, both adopter and adapter of so many British institutions, what you see on the surface tells you only part and a small part of that of the real story. In my humble opinion, uh, we focus too much on the visibly westernized parts of contemporary Asian story and don't dwell enough on the power of Asian culture and perceptions and thinking going on in the region. Nor do we understand how, in many forms, these cultures shape today's Asia and in time, in time uh, influence the world we will all inhabit. Uh, what we do dwell upon are economic factors and the increasing geopolitical weight of Asian players. But several sets of fundamentals, cultural as well as geopolitical and economic, should also be at the top of our minds. And I want to touch briefly on some of the enduring features of two of these civilizations, obviously uh, China and uh, India. What I want to convey to you when speaking of Chinese Asia and Indian Asia is that the vast cultural areas that these two giants have influenced over their histories uh, remains of significance because of their size when measured in time and space and in demography, but most importantly because of the genius of their creative powers their influence uh, far transcended their territories. The same can be said about classical Greece, of course, or Rome, uh, or Western Europe, or indeed the United States today. Geographic size matters, of course, but the equally vast realm of ideas matter too, a great deal. For their own purposes, the Chinese and Indian peoples developed philosophies and governance systems, technologies and engineering skills, unique and easily identifiable forms of artistic expression and so forth, the means to meet their everyday needs and those of their societies. Many of these technologies and art forms were so far advanced and co uh, compared to those of the neighbors that they were systematically borrowed, copied, adapted over many centuries to become fully appropriated by people who in some instances were their bitter enemies. Um, this really came uh, through to me uh, a few years ago. I lived in Vietnam in the 1970s, uh, and I traveled there occasionally, and not so many years ago, my wife and I were in, uh, in Hanoi, and we went to the Vietnam National Museum of History, that's the building. Um, some of the exhibits narrated uh, the thousand year, about a thousand years of Sino-Vietnamese conflict and warfare, with the plucky Vietnamese regularly wresting victory from certain defeat from the Chinese, always against all odds. It was all very stirring stuff. Oh, of course, they dealt with uh, pesky French and Americans, but that, that was just a short, that was easily dealt with and didn't take that much time. 
this was all very stirring, except that the building uh, that houses the museum was built by the French. Um, uh, and the dominant architectural themes and decor of, and painting styles inside and outside the building uh, were Chinese. The power of China's ideas and aesthetics was so great uh, that the Vietnamese had to use them to express their own periodic rejection of the dominant influence of China. Uh, you can find ample examples of uh, this kind of Chinese cultural embrace um, and equal political resistance in other parts of uh, Asia, particularly Japan, Korea, and some parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, this type of uh, uh, influence also emanated uh, from India. Its reach uh, was also huge. Cambodia and central Vietnam, parts of the Malay Peninsula, Sumatra and Java, all the way to Bali, in fact. Hinduism, in particular, influenced religious belief, language, uh, and thought, uh, and the arts, uh, written systems, and so on and so forth. And some of these influences predate Buddhism in China. Some of you will, will know that this is Angkor Wat in Cambodia, which is in fact the largest Hindu-inspired temple in the world. Its walls narrating scenes from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, uh, these great Indian epics. It progressively became a Theravada Buddhist uh, temple. So today you visit it and it's Theravada Buddhists who, uh, who are there. I'm trying to make two points. The expanse of Chinese and Indian cultural space may no longer correspond with the political maps uh, of Asia, but they now and will increasingly in the future reverberate in the geopolitics of the region. This is simply because these two countries have become so big in so many significant ways and because size generates an inevitable dynamic to which the neighbors have to adjust or to which they have to react. And right now in parts of the South China Sea and East China Sea, we're seeing the react part uh, of this. Secondly, the DNA and the economic development of these two societies, India and China, their gravitational uh, pull, so to speak, will be very different. They will affect their regions and by extension the rest of us in very different ways. So I'm going to talk a little bit about somewhat arbitrarily certain aspects of, uh, of that uh, DNA in terms of what I call Indian Asia. Uh, when I moved uh, to uh, India following about uh, over two decades in uh, North Asia, uh, including as ambassador to China and then ambassador to Japan, the first thing I learned was how high are the Himalayas. Uh, I had thought, um, naively I guess, that I would uh, have at least some of the tools necessary to understand uh, aspects of India based on the experience that I had in, in North Asia. Um, and that somehow these two powers had influenced each other. Well, of course, I couldn't be more wrong. The Himalayas are high, uh, and the Tibetan plateau is very broad, making travel between South Asia and Northeast Asia until modern times forbidding. The centers of Chinese and Indian civilization, uh, the Wei and Yellow River basins in China and the Gangetic Plain in India, are 2,500 miles apart, which is about the distance between the Caspian Sea and, and Paris. There were very limited exchanges between Han and Indian cultures. Substantial cross-border trade was a practical impossibility. The one potentially powerful linkage, Buddhism, which was embraced, uh, which, was, which was born in India, embraced by the Tibetans, eventually moving to uh, about the second century uh, in the common era, um, uh, could have been a bridge, but uh, it, by the time it reached China, it had largely disappeared in India. And on the other hand, Hinduism and Islam, the two essential foundations of India, for their part, have not touched the Chinese heartland. Accordingly, uh, until the 20th century, the kind of mass integration that brings people together has been extremely limited. And the arrows of societal development have pointed in very different directions. These two countries, maybe everyone know, knew this, but I had to learn it, could not have been more different. Sometimes I like to think of things or concepts in, in terms of, of paintings and artworks. So if, if, chi if China is Paul Klee, um, India is William de Kooning. Um, the thing you have to remember about India is that like this de Kooning painting, uh, what appears to be chaos is actually another form of order. Many non-Indians find India to be visually and organizationally chaotic, 
Many Indians would agree. But chaos is not the same thing as disorder. There is an Indian order, one that assembles this incredible plethora of peoples, languages, sights, and sounds, and gives it sufficient cohesion to sustain an Indian state, an Indian identity, and Indian patriotism. And this uniquely Indian order reflects, of course, its own DNA. I'm sorry, I was supposed to show you, this is the disorder in the, in the, in some of the streets, just an average day in downtown Delhi. Uh, for one thing, the neat, self-contained uh, geography of today's India, in fact, is a very new phenomenon. It's a bit like today's European Union, belying millennia of division and even warfare. Um, uh, the cultural heartland of India has been the north, the birthplace of Hinduism and the efflorescence of Islam. It represents the conservative heart of India, the platform for much of its dominant political history and its links uh, with the mountains and plateaus that extend all the way to Iran. Uh, but equally formative is the Dravidian South, which has had its own lengthy periods of independence from the north powerful kingdoms and satrapies, a different uh, tropical climate, and its own trade and cultural linkages across the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. In fact, today, the, uh, the most dynamic parts of, or many of the most dynamic parts of India are actually in the south. And this north-south divide tells uh, only part of the story. We're just going to run through very rapidly uh, four periods of, uh, of Indian history, and you'll see how things bounce around. This is the uh, Mauryan uh, Empire. This was a Buddhist um, uh, empire in the, before the Common Era. So you just see where it operated. Uh, then the Pratihara Empire, which was also which was a Hindu set of empires. This was essentially from the 6th to 11th centuries. And then the uh, uh, Islam movement, and progressively over the, over the centuries, uh, the Delhi Sultanates ruled the country. And then we had the Great Mughal Empire. Um, which is one of the great, greatest stories in the history of, of mankind, virtually unknown in, to most, uh, most Canadians, but certainly as significant as uh, all, uh, Rome and the other great empirical stories. Uh, imperial stories uh, covered most of con contemporary India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, good swaths of Iran, Afghanistan. The most notable achievement uh, known to Westerners, that is, is of course the Taj Mahal, which is, uh, was a product, uh, Shah Jahan, uh, during the um, uh, 16th century. Uh, and um, if you only go to India for one reason, it's to go to see the Taj Mahal, by the way. Um, the la court language of the Mughals was Persian, to show you how sophisticated and cosmopolitan they were. Uh, the British came in, and uh, the pink parts, as you might have guessed, uh, are British. Uh, but what most people don't, aren't aware of is that the British Raj still had to deal with 565 nominally sovereign princely states. Some of them, such as Jammu and Kashmir, quite large and, uh, and uh, Islamic, uh, and some quite rich. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the last Nizam of Hyderabad. Hyderabad is in south central uh, India, uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, capital. That's Sir Osman Ali Khan Siddiqui, who was the richest man in the world in the first half of the 20th century. An important point here is that the Indian space, um, uh, and including the Indian uh, political space, stretch from Iran and almost Kabul and Afghanistan all the way to Burma. Well, today, of course, um, that is no longer the case. Uh, the Indus Valley is in Pakistan. The, um, uh, the uh, delta of the Ganges, another fundamental uh, civilizational uh, dimension of India, is in Bangladesh. Uh, the ebb and flow of dynasties and empires continues to impact on India's political and administrative DNA. It gives it a strong sense of local and regional autonomy and contributes to today's immense challenge of forging national agreed objectives and policies, as we shall discuss uh, shortly. So let's consider another driver of uh, Indian, um, of the, the variability and variety of India. Hinduism is the font, uh, and for many Westerners, perhaps the most recognizable of India's cultural and philosophical contributions. Looked at from a distance, uh, its spectacular temples and dramatically colorful divinities, however varied, speak persuasively of a comprehensive aesthetic and belief system. 
But once you are inside Hinduism, that unity seems to break down. Um, uh, for one thing, according to some of the Vedas, there are 330 million divinities uh, in the uh, Hindu uh, pantheon. And you won't be surprised to learn that there's no real agreement as to who is the superior divinity. Uh, many believe that, in fact, the, the largest group believe that it's Shiva, uh, whose uh, adherents uh, uh, are in the hundreds of millions. Uh, then there's Vishnu, whose ten avatars, it's ten personalities, if you like, include uh, generously uh, the Buddha. The reason they have so many heads and arms, by the way, is to convey the notion of all of the blessings and all of the, the, all of the, uh, the wealth of their, of their philosophy and their virtues. Uh, my favorite is Shakti, at least as one woman divinity um, in, the, uh, in, the, in my short list here. There's also Ganesha, uh, the uh, elephant god. There are more people who believe Ganesha is the supreme being of, uh, of uh, the universe than there are Canadians, by the way. And at the end, we're going to have a vote as to who should be the top, top deity here. So bear all of this in mind. Um, India's linguistic and regional identities, its expansive historical geography, its most powerful but variegated uh, belief systems, and the reverberations of the caste system. We didn't get into that, but there are thousands of castes that still operate. All of these shape India's identity and its approach to its development in modern Asia. Uh, and you'll need to uh, bear that in mind when we get to modern Asia in a few moments. So let's talk a little bit about Chinese Asia. Now, there are possibly in the audience uh, Chinese Canadians or Japanese, uh, sorry, uh, Japanese Canadians or Korean Canadians who won't like the idea of Chinese Asia uh, because of the tremendous difference between their cultures and, and uh, China's cultures, and uh, largely uh, they are correct. Uh, but the fact remains that um, uh, the, there are features of Chinese civilization, and we'll touch on a few of them, that have permeated uh, China's borders and profoundly influenced the neighborhood in ways that are not only similar, but indeed uh, enduring. In a sense, we're talking about Chinese soft power, um, whether we're talking about painting or architecture or, or philosophy or uh, Hanza. And in terms of, uh, sorry, I wanted to show you that, that's sort of the geographic space. Um, I'll just say a few words about Confucianism, which is uh, a feature that uh, I'm sure that you all know something about. I'm just going to run through very quickly, but my point being, as these are some of the features of Confucianism that you can find virtually everywhere in Asia, and it's an indication of the, of the spread of uh, traditional, some forms of traditional Chinese thinking. Confucius, as you probably know, is a 6th, 5th century uh, Chinese thinker about politics. He believed that, that politics should be based on ethics. He was not terribly successful in those terms in political terms, but he was tremendously successful in shaping uh, ethical perspectives of, uh, of Chinese civilization. Um, uh, some of the features of Confucianism that you see in any, any good Chinese restaurant here in, uh, here in Waterloo and in the Kitchener, extended family, uh, the locus of, uh, as locus of self-definition and responsibility. Also, in many cases, um, the establishment of uh, the center of uh, family business. Uh, leadership provided by the patriarch. Uh, these are phenomena that one sees in China, in greater China, in Korea and Thailand uh, very much today. Uh, an emphasis on social harmony and consensus over confrontation and dissent. You certainly see that in China. These are Japanese salarymen uh, exercising a bit. Uh, this picture is a bit dated because I think one of the, the things have changed tremendously in, Gi in Japan now, and some Japanese now actually loosen their neckties when it's over 90 degrees. So this is, this is a sign of social breakdown in Japanese terms. Um, uh, there's a commitment to, uh, harmonic, uh, to harmony achieved uh, through economic growth rather than uh, civil uh, liberties. We see that, obviously, in China today, uh, but you find it in Taiwanese history, in, in recent Taiwanese history, recent Korean history, certainly uh, the Japanese uh, imperial period, and I including in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, where collective effort uh, forced everyone to downplay their personal um, uh, yeah, interests. Uh, perhaps the most rec recognizable feature everybody knows is the emphasis on education. Uh, some of you will know the uh, Program for International Student Assessments, the PISA scores run by the OECD, and every three years they run this. And 
there are editorials in the Globe and Mail and everywhere saying that how come Canadians aren't at the top? Because the top positions tend to be, not exclusively, uh, but they tend to be Chinese, Japanese, Taiwanese, Singaporeans, Koreans, uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, another concept, uh, most notable in China, and also with its roots in Confucianism, is that of Guanxi, uh, which I'm not pronouncing correctly, um, but it would be familiar to many of you, I'm sure. In the broad sense, it's a sense of mutual obligation embedded in all social relations extending beyond the family. This is fundamental to operating in, uh, in China today. But you find it, for example, in Japan, where it's called uh, Giri. Everybody who's got Japan experience knows all about Giri. So I'm not saying that all, you know, only Asia has uh, these virtues. Education is very important to you know, Western civilization as well, to Canada and that sort of thing. But the way that they come together in Asia makes it recognizable. And this sort of uh, cultural, if you like, um, influence is behind some of the thinking in, in China of its right to regional uh, hegemony. Now, we're on the home stretch, believe it or not. Um, we're just going to talk briefly about today, uh, today's India. Um, I'm ecstatic that uh, there is a new government in Delhi, if only because I can't really say very much about where it's headed. It just, Prime Minister Modi was just appointed on Monday, so anything I might say was going to be pretty speculative. Uh, but uh, the point is uh, that, uh, the point that I do want to leave is that from 1947 until today, India is fundamentally a socialist, socialized economy. Huge swaths of the economy are run uh, by aspects of the government. And those that aren't are under very strong uh, government regulatory systems. This is the way the, the Indians wanted it, inspired by Fabian socialism in, uh, from Britain. Um, heavily subsidized, uh, rain, huge range of products, what have you. Um, and this has been uh, the Congress Party, the previous uh, government, and indeed the, most of the governments uh, uh, from 1947 onward. They were defeated uh, in the last month and a half. So we may, as happens in democracies, you know, throw the uh, blackguards out. And that's what uh, India is starting to live uh, through. And they may be interested in changing the economic uh, model. The government has uh, vast new challenges, creating 12 million real jobs per year, if you can imagine. Has to expand the industrial sector, and it has to do that through inviting foreign investment which is very restricted in India. Uh, it has to allow um, companies to purchase land, which is extremely difficult in India. And even if you purchase it, land use is determined uh, through different sets of rules. All of this has been talked about for years in India. Um, it has worked a bit in uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, Gujarat uh, province, uh, but we'll have to see where he goes. Um, uh, his uh, supporters, are Hindu nationalists who are not in favor of economic reform and the labor movement who is especially not uh, in favor of economic reform. So we'll see where that uh, takes us. Now having said that, um, Modi does have uh, three uh, principal things going for him in my opinion. First of all, he won the victory very much himself. Um, he knows that he has to turn the front part of this picture like the back part of that picture. There's general agreement in India of this uh, requirement. Um, uh, there is a real desire, I experienced it myself when I was living in India, uh, for uh, transformation. Um, uh, but it's not a transformation along Chinese lines. They do not accept that, that form. But they have to address um, these, some of these fundamental issues that I've talked about. The big plus is the business community, which is strongly a supportive uh, of uh, uh, of this because they suffer the most. First of all, they have to build their own campuses to educate their staffs. All of those books you read by, or some of you read by Thomas uh, Friedman about um, in India's modern sector, this is, uh, this is an example of that. That's all, that's all undertaken within the confines of spaces that these business communities had developed, um, especially in the southern part of, uh, uh, of India. So. Modi wants to transform the country so that more of this uh, takes place. But he has to address uh, India's absolutely uh, disastrous uh, infrastructure deficit, and he has to address the question of education. Um, China, uh, India's population is younger than China's. They have what they call a demographic uh, dividend. Um, but um, unless these uh, children and uh, their older siblings are educated, 
he's not going to have the workforce that he needs to, to modernize uh, uh, to modernize India. And India's problem, sorry, there's supposed to be another one here. But anyway, India's uh, uh, issue has been a very, very, in my opinion, poor political class. Uh, and we'll see if Mr. Modi can bring this, uh, bring this forward. Uh, now, let me just see if I can we've talk about modern China. Again, I'm just, uh, we'll just spend a few minutes on this. Um, you're all familiar with the China story. There's no need for me to get into uh, a great uh, uh, description of that. Uh, just know uh, that um, China's power continues to grow. It's the largest country in PPP terms, purchasing power parity. According to the IMF, it's now achieved that. Uh, within about, take a guess, five years, it will, have, in dollar terms, have a larger economy than the United States. Even at a 7.5 slow growth rate, this year, uh, China's economy will grow by almost a trillion dollars. And so uh, at, at 9 trillion, it will, uh, the U.S. is about 15.5. Uh, so we are seeing the future before our eyes. And um, this chart, which I won't describe at any great length, shows that China is the world's biggest trader today. Uh, it is the largest purchaser of uh, about 14 of the top commodities that go into manufacturing, has more millionaires and billionaires than even in the United States. Um, by 2020, it's going to have um, 220 cities uh, by the mid-20s, we'll have 220 cities of more than a million people. In Canada, we have three. Um, uh, the United States has nine, and Europe has 25. Uh, so you get a sense of the scope. Now, uh, so that's sort of the big picture stuff. But um, uh, as people say, and I said, you know, even when I was ambassador in China, if you take any number and you multiply it by 1.3 billion, you get a huge number. And if you take any number and you divide it by 1.3 billion, you get a small number. And uh, so all of these superlatives have to be looked at uh, with a closer uh, set of eyeglasses. Um, yes, a $9 trillion economy in 2013, but it's 83rd in per capita, in per capita terms. Uh, the World Economic Forum uh, rates it 29th in terms of its global competitiveness. China, uh, Freedom House ranks China's freedom of the press 85th. Uh, so you get a lot of, one, on the one hand, this, and on the one hand, that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in, with, when you're looking at China, it's something you have to keep uh, very much uh, uh, in mind. The Chinese uh, leadership has the same, not kind, but the same uh, breadth of reforms that it has to undertake as Mr. Modi is facing in, uh, in uh, India. Uh, it has to um, uh, revamp its enterprise governance, land ownership, big issue in China as well, labor laws, opening markets to greater competition and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, the, two the challenges in both countries are uh, immense. I was going to talk about, elaborate a bit on, actually I was going to say a word about interest rates, but I won't uh, in the interest of time here. And uh, so we can be able to address some of, these, uh, some of these issues perhaps in the question period. So let me just get to my conclusion. Um, you know, in 45 minutes we've covered the entire history of China and India. Um, so what kind of conclusion which is actually useful to the exercise? First of all, um, India is not on a China-like growth and transformation trajectory. I'm, I'm quite convinced of that. Economic reformers such as Modi favor material uh, modernization, better roads, improved government services, improved conditions for doing business, with trickle-down benefits to the vast Indian underclass, whose poor, by the way, are more numerous than all the poor in Africa. Um, uh, Indians do not have a revolutionary tradition. Uh, there's no talk of mandates of heaven as you have uh, in Chinese history. For all of their material difficulties and the variable competence of their public officials, Indians enjoy their freedoms and their civil liberties, their raucous newspapers and TV, their Bollywood movies and cricket, all far from the politicians and their definitions of what should constitute the national will. Uh, they are spared the lingering fear of an oppressive political uh, party apparatus or mass movements initiated by arbitrary leaders resulting in occasionally bloody ends. India, to my mind, will continue to define very much its own form of modernization, which will continue to protect the immense vari uh, immensely variable social, religious, class, and uh, cultures uh, that define India. This is what, to all appearances, Indians by and large want. And India's attention is irretrievably domestic. It towers in size over its immediate neighbors, except for China, uh, 
and has international ambitions focused on its economic growth and regional stability. It's less culturally assertive uh, than its history would allow it to be, largely because uh, its um, uh, current cultural mix is so variable uh, as are its people. Um, China's trajectory is very different. Its leaders are seeking to return to uh, form a historical and regional hegemony um, based on the accumulation of wealth and power. And it can be argued that by and large these are national objectives which vast swaths of the Chinese public want. However, China's hyperspeed uh, transformation and its trans-border manifestations worry many, Chi uh, many people outside China, but they also worry many people within China. Many Chinese want their modernization to include a civil society, sorry, I, I'm trying to cut this back here, a civil society supported by a transparent and independent uh, legal institutions, an environment that won't kill them. Uh, seven of the world's most polluted cities are in, uh, are in China. I just caught a glimpse of one of these. Um, an education system that uh, will make them world-class technocrats, scientists, act, um, artists, and teachers. They also want good neighborly policies and peaceful prosperity. And I think that these aspirations uh, are also part of the uh, Chinese mix. So if you carry away one point uh, from tonight's presentation, let it be that you can't understand India or China's trajectories without a knowledge of their past as well as their approaches to what uh, that they have taken to modernize their societies. Their futures uh, will be determined by the quality of their leaders and the freedom and ability of their citizens to choose their own futures. Thank you very much. So this is the time that we all have to, we, we all get to have some fun, which means that you get to... Us uh, too. Pardon me? We get to have fun too. We get to have fun too. Okay, great. Because you get to think about the implications of this uh, remarkable tour, historical, panoramic, visual, uh, a tour of ideas, history, and then you get to soon come down to microphones on either side of the stairs, as I, I've decided the seats, and ask questions. We'll also have questions being posed by uh, viewers on our, our webcast. So let me just start um, and try and touch on something which you actually didn't t touch on, other than the final set of comments raises implications. For all of us here, we will be aware that in the last two years, one of the, the, um, the parts of the language of the media around Asia has been this question of President Obama's announcement of the pivot to Asia. And there has often been a, a common presentation that this pivot to Asia is it has a security dimension. That's the way it's often portrayed. Um, and I'm wondering, you've given us some insights into two remarkable societies that have um, deep historical pr presence, have enormous potential capacity to affect the global economy, global society, global politics, uh, and yet are also, at the same time, struggling with the challenges of domestic transition. Infrastructure, economic growth and development, the Gini Index, the gaps between rich and poor, um, the challenge of the globalized world. So clearly, using Obama simply as representation of the West, there's an acknowledgement that there's not only a dramatic challenge emerging from, from Asia, but to put a more positive spin, tremendous opportunity as well. So would you, you perhaps share with us your thoughts about um, 
where, where some of those opportunities might, might reside. Um, where are those opportunities for the rest of the international community to engage India, to engage Ch China, uh, to take advantage of um, what is, is evolving beyond, uh, certainly beyond our control, but in which we want to position ourselves in such a way that we're going to be part of the process and not simply observers to it. Okay, well that's a huge question. You know. Well, you gave us a huge presentation. <laughs> I guess the uh, I guess what I'd, I'd start by saying um, to try to try to unpack at least uh, some of this. Uh, in a sense, it depends on who's asking the question. If it's the government of Canada that's asking the question, Prime Minister Harper and Foreign Minister uh, Blair and uh, and and, uh, uh, and uh, the people around them. Then what we're talking about is um, a response that has a uh, uh, that tries to capture the principal sets of Canadian interests: security, obvious trade and economic movement of peoples, immigration, um, and um, uh, an effort to make sure that Canadian policies uh, are have a regional dimension as well as a country by country dimension. So that, uh, as you say, uh, David, in your question. Uh, we have um, a structure here, a welcoming set, if you like, of, of, of national policies supported by the Canadian public uh, that has the capacity to pick and choose that both from us towards uh, the region, but also uh, the, country, the people in the countries of the region to respond to our opening. You need some sort of a, some sort of a, uh, a combination of usually fairly straightforward um, uh, long-term sets of strategies so that in a general sense our trade people, uh, our trade environment um, uh, offered by Canada to, to the region is one that they want to participate in. And uh, so there has to be, part of the response to your question is, would have to be shaped by the government of Canada. And to some extent, we're not going to get into this too much tonight, but I'm one of those people who feels that we have not done this. But that's that's, uh, be that as it may, uh, I'm a very strong believer, and I think there are probably some uh, others in, in the room, that foreign policy and, and, and uh, taking advantage of the developments of, uh, uh, that are taking place in Asia isn't just a government issue. It's a, a, an issue for individuals, even. It's an issue for businesses. It's an issue for CG, for University of Waterloo. Um, uh, in, the per, in, in the definition of of the interests of these institutions, arts groups, you know, the Vancouver Opera Company, uh, or what have you, in defining what their objectives are, uh, then, uh, and looking at what is happening in Asia, then based on the, the specific interests of these Canadian groups, and again, they can be individuals, somebody, maybe there are young people in the audience tonight, many young people I can see, um, about all looking same, uh, same hair color as me, uh, maybe they want to, their idea is to go and teach in, in, in Japan or Korea and that sort of thing. So what I'm, what I'm driving at is that uh, there are multiple answers depending on who's asking. And uh, the, the breadth of Asia is so huge and developments are so seemingly consistent moving in a positive direction in terms of growth and, uh, and uh, globalization that every one of us, all the way to the government of Canada, can define and seek to achieve objectives. And if our objectives are well articulated and clear, there will be Indians and Chinese and Japanese and Indo Indonesians and Thais who want to buy into that. Uh, so you have to look at it from both ends, I guess, of the scale. Okay, let me just follow that up with, with a brief question and then we'll open up to the audience. You, in your closing comments, you, you stated that um, one of the great differences between India and China is that as India focuses on its domestic developments and its domestic challenges, it is, in the sense, in the context of a huge um, domestic environment with regional implications and without asserting kind of a historical hegemony, without asserting mm -hmm. the lost em empire. Where China, on the other hand, part of the dynamic here is a return to hegemony, wealth, um, strength, um, and a reassertion of its presence 
and the recognition of that presence by Asia and perhaps well, well beyond. And certainly when one follows Chinese statements in international affairs, there's the sense that China at the moment is in this danger, dangerous position of feeling that it's kind of an unsatisfied glo global power. Its status is not being fully recognized other than as um, creating an economic opportunity for the outside. Uh, if you're sitting at, whether it's a Canadian businessman or the president of a university in Canada uh, or government, does that suggest that, in fact, uh, given their similar sizes, that perhaps you should be dealing with an India rather than China if you have to make choices mm -hmm. because of the potential Im implications? Uh, doesn't, does it even suggest that having a sense of history and culture of these two countries may be an appropriate thing to do from the point of view of, of human inquiry but the bottom line doesn't make any difference in, in terms of the, the terms of reference of how you do business. The bottom line is they each have their interests, we have our interests, and we're going to pursue them. And this larger issue of civilizational issues, really, it's a curiosity. But in this world of globalized forces, it doesn't make much difference. Yeah, well, I, would, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put, a, or put ter, uh, things in those terms. Um, I don't think it's ever either or in any generic sense. Um, if it, it depends very much, uh, if let's say we're talking about CG or we're talking about the Balsillie School or, or University or, or, or uh, Laurier here. It really, again, it starts with here. It's got to, it was always my view as a diplomat that everything starts in Canada and everything ends in Canada. And uh, the, so it really a question of institutions, uh, and, and I think a lot of them have done just that. You know, define what their interests are uh, and, and pick and choose in Asia where the opportunities are greatest to achieve their uh, objectives. Uh, and of course you have to prioritize and in some cases, uh, in fact, I've, and as you have, I've seen them all. In some cases it makes much more sense to go to India. Other cases it may, may make more sense to go to Thailand or Japan or Korea or China. Uh, that's the first point I make. The second point I make, having said all that, you know, the big players, uh, if you're going to position yourself, if you're in the 19th century uh, somewhere and you're looking at where to position yourself in the medium term, you better have some interest in what's happening in the United States because it seems to be exploding. Well, these two countries are going to be significant. So then you make a strategic decision with respect to, it may not be an immediate priority, but as a, a medium term priority, we have to have some forms of engagement that may not pay off immediately, but India is going to be there as a very powerful country in 5, 10, 15, 23 years. Same thing with China. So you have to make uh, that, uh, that decision as well. The third point I'd make um, is uh, maybe to contest a bit. Uh, I forget the adjective you used about, well, the culture is kind of cute, but, but you didn't say that. But, but it's not really relevant. Well, of course, I disagree. I'm not saying that's what you intended. But um, uh, you can't operate. If you want to operate successfully in any country, if you come to Canada, and you're from Zambia, and you think that it's going to be like in Zambia, you're not going to be very successful in Canada. And it stands to reason. Uh, you have to, in my view, and it was always what I advised, and some of my diplomatic colleagues, certainly, if not all of them, you, you've got to have some understanding. You have to, uh, of, of the local culture, be able to, if only to connect at a human term, in human terms. I mean, if you, if you I, I used to tell business people, you know, Make sure you have one personal interest. Maybe it's golf, maybe it's music, uh, rock and roll or whatever. And find out, you know, just be, you know, Google a bit, get the top five Japanese rock bands just so that you can begin a conversation that you're interested in these things. So that you've demonstrated that you're not just considering these, uh, their, the companies or these people as potential, you know, a market, but that there is a commitment. Because in Asia, they look for that commitment much more than we do. Um, we uh, largely, for all sorts of reasons, but including we do so much trans-border business with the United States, same language, same time zones. Uh, you're not going to study Milwaukee's history uh, in order to uh, decide whether you want to import beer from there or not. But if, uh, but if you're dealing in Thailand, you better know something about Thailand or Japan. So I, I have always believed that at a very low cost, usually in, uh, in personal time, uh, demonstrating that kind of interest really pays off. 
Uh, and, uh, and of course, the more you know, the more interesting it gets. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, I guess the final point related to that would be that doing business in China is not like doing business in India. And if your strategy in China, you just move it to India, it's not going to work. Okay. There's a note on the screen that says that there will be no online questions right now because there's a technical issue with the webcast, which gives you folks in the audience a greater opportunity should you have a question to ask from here. And I see people approaching the mic. So let's uh, start with the mic right over here. Would you, just in, in, would you just briefly introduce yourself and raise the question? Please. Hi, I'm Marsha Redmond, and I've dealt with medical health, specifically uh, population and demographics. And 30 to 40 years ago, when we dealt with India and China, we looked at their ability to control their populations. It's happened over time, some ways acceptable to our standards, some ways not. And as I understand, India's growth rate has stabilized, death rate has not, because of uh, disease control and things like that. China, I'm not sure of. My question, I guess, when I specifically look at China, is whether they're using things like food, inability not to eat, and also pollution to influence and cull their population. That was your understanding at the time? Or are you asking if that's what's my happening? Question now, uh -huh. My question is, I perceive what's happening in the country of China is specifically whether do they have enough food for their population? Oh, okay. Is it continuing to grow? But also, when I see the massive smog and the industrialization and use of automobiles that's continuing, that can't be helping the people. But you know what? Do they care? Is that their way of calling the population? Well, um, I don't think uh, that uh, the Chinese leadership is setting out to cull the population. Uh, I, I don't believe that's the case at all. Uh, as far as uh, uh, nutritional standards, uh, they keep rising. Uh, China doesn't have any malnutrition uh, issues of, of significant size. I'm sure you can find villages in Gansu uh, where they don't, you know, and, and possibly Tibet and some of the, there are poor areas in China today. Uh, but there isn't the, uh, the the distribution system works much better, let's say, than it would in uh, than it would in India. Um, your point about pollution, if I understood it correct, uh, is bang on, um, because China has uh, uh, essentially um, it's not so much a question of sacrifice, but ignored the uh, the uh, uh, environmental dimensions of its of its growth strategy. And not for lack of advice, and not for lack of even pressure domestically. Uh, it, uh, every once in a while, for those of us who follow China reasonably closely, there are demonstrations, there are public responses to decisions on which they, no one was consulted to put in a chemical plant, let's say, near, very near a large uh, city. So the, uh, the mechanisms uh, are, to the extent that they're formally in place, to be able to uh, incorporate environmental concerns. Until now, uh, they haven't functioned properly. To be fair, the government of, uh, of Xi Jinping and uh, Li Keqiang, the, the premier, uh, says that the next phase of growth uh, has got to address this issue. And it has to address it because they, uh, while I don't, like I said, I don't agree with the culling business, uh, nevertheless, the fact is that people die from the pollution, which I think is your point. Uh, and that is d demonstrated. It's in the statistics. The consequences uh, are seen. And unless it's addressed, uh, it leads to problems of political stability. Th thank you. We have a, a questioner over here. And then we'll move back to that. Mic. Good evening. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Dimitri Pasricha. Um, one does not have to go too far from Kitchener or Waterloo to see the impact of modern Asia on modern Canada, so to speak, um, as Sun Life Financial, for example, uh, seems to be 
bringing people over from Asia, training them with their employees that they intend to lay off to uh, reduce their costs. So I wonder with your unique perspective of being in Asia for so long and also uh, sitting on the board of a, of, of a life insurance company, how does modern Canada compete with modern Asia and these giants um, from employment and those types of perspectives? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I'm not sure what you, your reference to Sun Life, but moving on from that. Um, no, I mean, uh, the, uh, quite apart from uh, the, the current review, let's say, of our, of our visa policies and the results of which we're still not fully aware and whether it's going to address the kind of issue that you've discussed, I think I'm not aware that Sun Life has had the problem. One of the banks had a problem uh, last year, one of the Canadian banks. Uh, but nevertheless, your, your question is, remains fundamentally valid because, you know, I used to say, and I sort of hinted at it tonight, but you already know this in this audience, Asia is coming, and it's coming big time. And it's not just going to come in terms of, uh, of manufacturing competition, uh, it's coming in services, we're going to have Chinese architectural firms uh, competing in Toronto, and, and so on and so forth. Well, we have to respond the way we respond to European competition, United States competition, Japanese, Korean. Of course, that's Asian. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's going to continue to be a constant, uh, uh, a constant struggle. That's the nature of the market economy. Um, but having said that, uh, the policies have got to be right. And uh, there has to be, uh, I don't think anyone here would dispute it, there has to be an assurance that Canadians... Um, uh, the Canadian needs are met uh, as much as the, the Canadians as part of the workforce, the Canadian labor market needs are met, uh, as well as the interests of, uh, of uh, the business community that wants to hire, let's say, uh, a specialist in one area or the other. These are, uh, let me tell you, I, I'm sure you, everybody knows this, these are tremendously complex, it sounds like a bureaucratic response, but the reality is when you look at how to administer, I, I was at you know, I did this from the top, so to speak, as ambassador. When you look at how you, how, do you combine, how do you create rules so that all of these objectives can be met, and it's very difficult, whether it's a conservative government or a liberal government or an NDP government or what have you. Uh, so it's, it's, it's going to be a, a, a constant policy challenge. But bigger than that is the competitive challenge. And that's something that, uh, you know, that we all have to address. And young people have to be uh, attuned to this um, in ways that in my generation, you know, I was, uh, I'm a little bit older, let's say, than most students at University of Waterloo, to say the least. Um, the labor market when I became, uh, when I graduated from university, uh, which was in the 1970s, is totally different than it is today. I think students uh, have to be really conscious of uh, the, not only the current reality, but as you say, the, the, the modern, the, the increasingly modern, or at least the continuously modernizing, Asia by a continuously modernizing Canada. Alex. I'm Alex Stevenson from CG, and as David knows, I've been looking forward to you coming tonight for weeks. <laughs> um, I've just finished reading Paul Evans' new book, and he talks about the history of Canada's engagement in foreign policy with China. And one thing that he mentions throughout the whole thing is that there's always been this tension between knowing that we need to actively engage in terms of trade and economy but being hesitant to so openly support um, a country like China that has huge human rights issues. And he talks about how Canada had this, you know, significant strategic relationship. I, I, I have to tell you, I'm having a lot of trouble understanding. I think it's the, maybe the mic. Yeah, the mic. Yeah. It's very, very, can you just get to the gist of your question? Sure. What, can you talk more about the tension between needing to support a country um, like China in terms of trade, but being aware that that relationship could be upset by humanitarian concerns. Yeah. Okay, no, I, that's an entirely valid question. Um, and I haven't read Paul's book yet, uh, so you're way ahead of me on that front. Um, the, um, uh, I, I was invested in China, but I was interested in China before that, and I, and I continue to be. Um, I have always rejected the notion that um, the relationship with any country, but in the, we're talking about China, can be defined by two, uh, a dichotomy that it's either a human rights issue or it's a, it's a trade issue. And either you're in favor of human rights or you're, uh, or you're ignoring human rights, 
for, uh, to pursue uh, uh, trade and economic objectives. The world is much more complicated uh, than that. And uh, for one thing, the dichotomy doesn't reflect the reality of, of Canada-China relations as it's lived today, whether it's Chinese immigrants coming to Canada, Waterloo students going to China uh, to, uh, uh, to pursue their studies, Chinese tourists coming to Canada, Canadian tourists going to China, Chinese investment, Canadian investment in China, and, that, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, exchanges between hospitals in Canada and hospitals in China. What I'm saying is that uh, for a country as big as Canada and, uh, uh, and as wealthy as Canada, with this breadth of interests that Canadians have and their institutions and their businesses and universities and so on, to bring it down to just two aspects is totally artificial. Um, uh, a strategy vis-a-vis -vis China has got to embrace human rights. Uh, not as a sort of a bureaucratic thing that you set aside, but it has to be done uh, in a strategic way because Canadians feel very strongly uh, about human rights. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it is up to government to capture that and to articulate it in ways that actually advance human rights in, uh, in China. You know, the, um, uh, the, the likelihood that uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China, is going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, um, you know, those Canadians are right. We really, we really should have uh, uh, British-inspired parliamentary democracy. You know, damn it, why didn't I think of it sooner? I don't think that's going to happen. Um, uh, what you want to see happen, and what, uh, uh, speaking from my experience and, and, and my continuing view, is you want to make it absolutely clear, clear uh, as the Canadians, since we're talking about the Canadian government, but also as Canadians, that this is a priority, and you, you our Chinese counterpart, you have to address it. Um, now, how you address it, how you articulate it in public, how you articulate it in private, that's all tactics. And if you're serious about human rights and uh, your objectives aren't PR in Canada but actually human rights in China, then you establish your strategy so that, and your tactics so that it addresses real things. And to me, the model is uh, Canada vis-a-vis -vis South African apartheid. Uh, you know, uh, what's his name? The, the, the president of, of, again, of South Africa who... Uh, who uh, agreed to bring Mandela back, uh, what was his name? Very, an extraordinary person. I'm sorry? De Clerc. Yeah, De Clerc, that's right. He didn't wake up in the morning and say, oh, the Canadians are right. It, it was the evolution of the debate. It was pressure from countries like Canada, uh, from Australia, from other countries as well, that made it, uh, made the cost, the, uh, the cost, if you like, of, uh, of uh, apartheid increasingly unpleasant and unaffordable. And all sorts of developments within South Africa. It'll be the same thing in China. I, I happen to believe, we, I didn't get into this, I, I think the Chinese revolution isn't over. I, I cannot conceive that the current Communist Party monopoly on power is eternal. I don't even conceive that it's going to be there uh, for even a generation. It's really not that functional over time. And it's certainly not responsive to what is an increasingly sophisticated, well-educated, well-traveled uh, Chinese population. The pressure for uh, reform uh, on human rights around in China has is, got to come from within. And it has to be echoed, if you like, and, and pushed from without, including by Canada. And you do that, and you pursue your trade, and you pursue your academic exchanges, and you pursue your... Uh, uh, a movement of students, and you pursue all your other objectives. Um, life is, and, and, and the life of countries and the interests of countries are much too complicated to bring them down to two factors, in my opinion. Yes, please. And then, then we'll go to the other mic. It's a beautiful uh, illustration of two giant country, China and India. I wonder if you can comment. These two, both countries, join, you're familiar with BRICS. What their effect by joining this organization in the world stage? And number one, and these two countries, they have different attitude toward religion. Is there have any effect religion on their policy? Thank you. I'm not sure. So, so the first one is about BRICS. 
the, the BRIC countries. Yeah. yeah the, and the second one is. Yeah. Did you get it? Either, either way. Okay. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the you know the BRICS is first of all it's a, a British economist who came up with it before the Chinese, Russians, or or Brazilians came up with it. Um, it's a, um, a largely artificial, not terribly substantive uh, grouping because the interests are just so different. They're geographically different regions, of course. The Russian economy is not doing well. You know, even the Brazilian economy is not doing very well. India, China's economy continues to do well. India has gone from 8% to 4.1, I guess, uh, last year. Modi wants to bring it uh, up. So it's a, it, it doesn't have a critical mass of issues that it that their common interests uh, would be so powerful that they would bring them on the international agenda, if you like, and say, this is how the trade system is going to work in the future. You know, fine WTO, but we're going to change the rules. They don't have that kind of cohesive power amongst them. So I don't see it as a big, uh, as a terribly significant factor. Andrew. Uh, Mr. Colonel, thank you very much. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the recent deal between Russia and China on energy. Yeah, I know that's a big deal. Um, and uh, uh, it's been mooted for, as I think everybody knows, for, for many, many years. And it's been accelerated, uh, particularly the price negotiations as a result of uh, uh, Ukraine situation, uh, the European response, and uh, that sort of thing. You might consider, for, to amuse yourself, that Russia is doing what successfully what Canada or Prime Minister Harper has tried to do <laughs> so far unsuccessfully of um, getting um, Chinese and Japanese uh, Korean buyers to sign long-term contracts with the, oil the Canadian oil and gas companies, particularly natural gas companies, uh, to make it worthwhile to build, to build the, uh, you know, the uh, gas lines uh, all the way to Kitimat, et cetera, and then, and then um, uh, putting in the uh, LNG facilities. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, Putin has achieved the uh, unobjective of uh, finding an alternative market for his natural gas. Uh, so that's, you know, good for him uh, and good for the Chinese. Uh, I saw some numbers uh, just last week that uh, Chinese um, natural gas demand is rising so rapidly that uh, between now and uh, 2030, which is not that far away in, in, these, in the terms of these uh, uh, these types of markets. Um, uh, China will need 20 equivalent of the deals that they just struck with, uh, uh, with Russia. Uh, so yes, significant, but not, not the game changer. And uh, there still uh, will be opportunities for Brunei and Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, uh, Mozambique and Canada, United States, which wants to start exporting natural gas. There's lots of gas. Um, and we, we've got, uh, it's not your question, but uh, our game isn't quite successful yet. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. The gentleman who's been waiting here. Thank you for coming tonight, sir. I'm Jesse McLean. I'm a master's student here at Belsilly. I'd like to solicit you for a comment on the Asian security situation. One hears a lot in the media and elsewhere about disputes over territory and resources in the region. Vietnam's upset with China, China's upset with Japan, no one seems to like North Korea very much. In your opinion, do you think there's a realistic prospect for a conflict breaking out in the region, or is this just media hot air? Well, it's not just media hot air. Um, just one comment about the media. You know, when I, when, when I was a public servant, of course, we had, uh, we, we have to a remain confidentiality of what we do and what we say in government policy in, in many cases, except for what are the greed lines. And um, uh, the, uh, the attitude among officials and politicians uh, as well uh, is that let's make sure we don't tell the media anything. And then that's the first attitude. And the second attitude is when the media try to put something together, the second attitude is, look at these idiots. They can't get the story straight, you know. <laughs> not that I'm not... <laughs> Please understand the background to what I'm saying here. Um, no, it's not just media hype. It's um, uh, it's a uh, it's the in-your-face manifestation uh, of a um, an inevitable readjustment of of uh, power relationships uh, 
between and among countries of, uh, in this case, uh, Northeast Asia and, uh, and uh, Southeast Asia, involving that hu huge player, uh, the United States, and the pivot that uh, David uh, referred to earlier. Um, it has tremendous lack of clarity as to what the Chinese objectives really are. Um, they have succeeded in um, accelerating the opposition to China throughout the region. They've ex they succeeded in countries such as uh, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, um, uh, uh, Korea and, and Japan already have their bilateral agreements, but strengthening of those agreements. They have succeeded in creating circumstances that are bringing the, country, the, liter the countries around, the literal countries, if you like, uh, around China to oppose them and to bring the United States as part of, their, uh, part of the debate. Some of this is very subtle. Some of it is, is, you know, is signaling through political... Some of it is moving ships uh, uh, into different areas. So it's a very delicate, very even dangerous situation. Uh, and I think everybody in this room knows that uh, you can't predict what might happen as a consequence of maybe an unintentional two ships ramming into each other, and there have already been a lot of those. There was a scramble of Chinese uh, aircraft just three days ago. Uh, uh, the Chinese, on the other hand, are built against the Japanese. The, uh, the Chinese are, are, appear to be building an air base in the Paracels, and, uh, uh, or at least not an air base, but a, a, landing, a landing strip. Um, so there is a, uh, what um, uh, Edward Ludwig, who's a very famous, uh, maybe you read uh, Ludwig, very famous strategist, says, you know, there's a logic of strategy, and China right now is only succeeding in creating opposition to itself. Um, and because we don't know what the deliberations are among Chinese officials uh, and, and senior government officials, we know that Xi Jinping is now the chair of the Foreign Policy and Defense Committee, that's public knowledge. Um, but what do they talk about, and what are their short, medium, and long-term objectives, uh, and how do they manage the transition from one to the other? You know, uh, it's very interesting, you probably, uh, as a student, you're probably aware of this, but those of us who are interested in history, uh, think of the Monroe Doctrine, in uh, which President Monroe in 1823 declared that the Americas were off-limits for, for the Europeans. Um, the United States in, in 1823 did not have the means to keep the Brits and the European powers from the Caribbean. But they built their navy and uh, uh, ultimately they were able to secure. Uh, and what we're seeing is, uh, again, the logic of strategy, if you like. What we're seeing is the Chinese uh, uh, basically asserting that all of these sea lanes that bring all of the oil and natural gas and resources into China and all goods out, right now they're in the hands of the United States. Uh, they should be in our hands either as well or exclusively. Uh, so in, live and in color uh, on the screen is, the, um, is a, a vivid, clear transition in power relations. Uh, the short-term consequences of which uh, are uh, uh, unpredictable. The long-term consequences of which will be uh, room for China to be uh, a maritime player. Just before we go to the last question, I just wanted to highlight the fact that how, how what you've just responded, how you've just responded, is in such contrast to how you might respond if we turn to India. Because in the, in the 80s and the 90s, when there was tremendous development and growth in Southeast Asia, institutionally, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and then in the 1990s, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the question of India concerned the Southeast Asians. Not that India was going to, be, was going to project its power, but that India, that wanted to become engaged in the politics and economics of the region, would bring the India-Pakistan conflict with it, and it would tie up the politics. There was, real, there was no military fear of an Indian mm -hmm. hegemon. There was rather a socio-cultural fear of this protracted conflict between India and Pakistan, and possibly Sri Lanka, interfering 
with the effort to integrate and normalize relations in Southeast Asia. That has faded tremendously, so that India is now a much more active participant in the affairs, both political and economic, of Southeast Asia, of the ASEAN Regional Forum, of ASEAN, of the ministers' meetings, so that when you compare, as you did, India and China, one of the remarkable differences is, as you were saying, that um, India is not um, expanding in terms of a regional hegemon, or if it is, it's certainly not perceived that way by those who might seen, be seen, as, uh, see itself, themselves as most vulnerable. Yeah. I mean, there's the issue of capacity. Uh, you know, the Indian Navy has all sorts of problems. They, in fact, the, uh, the uh, commander of the Navy resigned uh, late last year over, over problems within the Navy. Uh, they have, like the Chinese, they have one aircraft carrier, but uh, uh, they've had all sorts of problems with that. So there's a, there's a very big difference between emerging Chinese capacity and non-emerging right. Indian capacity. And the Indians are concerned about the Chinese military penetration in the Adam and Sea, yeah, and that right. whole area. Yeah. So that's very interesting. The, the Chinese have built um, uh, commercial ports all the way to Africa. But these ports could easily be turned into, into bases. Our last question from the audience, please, sir. My name is Jack Redmond. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, a uh, uh, applied or development anthropologist. I'd like to take up your challenge or suggestion, Ambassador Crone, with regard to looking at things in a wider perspective, either from the chronological or from the 30,000 feet uh, you know, airplane example. I'd like to take the, the historic uh, graph that you indicated in terms of uh, uh, world economics from 1870 to the current or the 2030 time. Uh, I'd like to push it back to 1450 in your mind for a moment, okay? And then I'd like to say in 1870, the idea of hegemony, okay, was basically from a modern standpoint in terms of expanding uh, powers, Russia, uh, Japan, or Russia, uh, Britain, France, etc. All, all the colonializers. So let's, let's look at hegemony in terms of what it means and spheres of influence and not place it just in terms of um, military power or economic power as it was placed in 1870 and look at it from spheres of influence of religion, spheres of in which again, your examples of the uh, uh, great Genghis Khan and its establishment of empires throughout Asia and uh, Asia Minor. And if you look at this together with the issue of entertainment today, corporate statuses where, where companies have greater economic power than individual countries, and say that today we have many different types of spheres of influ influence and hegemony, and they're all competing for the time, money, and attention in this world. We also have the computer connectivity. The question can you, can you, what's, uh, you know, what's the question? The question is, how do we as Canadians say, we get our best part of the pie with all of the competing interests here, not only on the military level, but on all of the other levels in terms of cultural and um, other th levels. Uh, did you get that? Or? <laughs> I'm not sure if there's a question or that was... Yeah. Well, you're saying how, how do, does Canada take advantage of... Yeah, well, I, I think we sort of talked about that at the, uh, at the outset. Uh, and, and as I said, it's sort of a, it has to be a combination of, of understanding both at a national level, but also at institutional level, and in some cases even at individual level. What is it that you want to achieve as an institution or as a government of Canada, um, and to what extent what's happening in Asia can, benefit, can, can help you achieve those objectives. And those are, there's no, there is no one formula, you know, it really is, um, uh, you know, 
University of Waterloo will have its strategy, and McGill will have its strategy, and Manulife has its strategy, and I'm on the board of the airport in, in Vancouver, and we've got our strategy there. And each, each of these is different. Uh, each of these strategies is different. Uh, and they operate in different markets and uh, with different sets of objectives. So, again, it all comes back to who you are and what you want to do. Joseph, thank you. I'm going to turn the mic over to Fred. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joseph and uh, David, for moderating. And, and I really want to thank Joseph not only for delivering the lecture here tonight, for, but for all the jobs he's doing in Waterloo over the uh, today and, and tomorrow. Uh, the audience may like to know that um, the former ambassador has dedicated his day tomorrow to helping the students at the Balsley School, working with the master students, listening to their projects that they're presenting at year end and adjudicating. He's doing all of that uh, for nothing more than a free lunch, so really out of the goodness of his heart. Uh, so for um, dedicating your time here and also for helping us tonight to understand how uh, China's and India's uh, past have helped shape their present and how the quality of leadership is going to determine how they adapt to their very different uh, uh, challenges and futures uh, for all of those perspectives from your experience and your wisdom in many years of diplomacy. Uh, we thank you again very much. And thank you to the Balsley School and to Director uh, John Ravenhill and Andrew Thompson of the Balsley School for helping to arrange all of these events and for co-sponsoring tonight. The video of tonight's webcast will be posted to the CG website. We uh, will post a blog about this event where you can add your own comments. And our next public events are coming up very quickly. This coming Monday, Nobel Peace Laureate Professor Muhammad Yunus uh, will be here to give an afternoon lecture titled, We Are Not Job Seekers, We Are Job Givers. Uh, the auditorium seats are sold out for that event uh, with a wait list, but you can still register to join the live webcast. On June 4th, uh, this coming week, our cinema series concludes for the season with a screening of The Square. That is a documentary following uh, several revolutionary leaders through the recent Egyptian revolution. And then on June 18th, we conclude our season's lecture series with the annual media panel. Very popular event, co-sponsored always by the Canadian International Council's Waterloo Region Branch. This year, the theme is Journalists in Exile, and our panelists are those who found safe re refuge in Canada uh, after threats and persecution for their work as journalists in their home countries. So be sure to register for our events newsletter, receive information on all of our events, and thank you for coming to CG this evening. Have a safe journey home. My name is Fred Kuntz and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of our signature lecture series. Thanks also to, this, uh, to those joining us uh, through our live webcast. Following this evening's address, we welcome questions from either audience here in the auditorium at the microphones in the aisles, or else uh, if you're at home watching on your computer through the live chat function on your screen. Please remember to state your name and to keep your questions brief. It's one thing to learn about the changes and developments taking place in Asia by watching and reading the news, but to witness the progress firsthand with a clear view of the political arena is something completely different. Tonight, Ambassador Yosef Caron will share with us some of his experiences as Canadian Ambassador to the People's Republic of China and the Republic of India and the realities he witnessed that continue to shape the region's present and future. Here to introduce our distinguished speaker is CG Vice President of Programs, David DeWitt, who joined CG in 2011 and oversees the strategy and implementation of all of CG's research-related activities. David is from York University, where he's uh, on leave as a professor of political science, and he also served as a, as a director of the Center for International and Security Studies and the Associate Vice President of Research, Social Sciences and Humanities. Join me now in welcoming David DeWitt. Thanks, Fred, and welcome, everyone. Whoops. 
Joseph Caron was a public servant for four decades. Interspersed with assignments in, the private, sec in private sector ventures, with responsibilities in Japan, China, Hong Kong, Korea, and Taiwan. His principal professional appointments were in foreign affairs and international trade, along with an assignment to the Privy Council office. In three consecutive appointments from 2001 to 2010, Mr. Caron became the, the only Canadian diplomat to date to have served as our ambassador to arguably the most significant Asian countries, China, Japan, and India. Prior to those very senior appointments, he was Canada's senior official, the Assistant Deputy Minister, responsible for our diplomatic and trade activities in Asia Pacific and Africa and the Middle East. He served as Canada's senior official for Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC, responsible for the participation of Canada's Prime Minister in those summits. He has served at the center of Canadian trade and diplomatic activities, including in the Foreign and Defence Secretariat of the Privy Council Office under Prime Minister Trudeau, and over the years that followed in the G8 and in eight economic summits. Since retiring from the diplomatic service, Joseph Caron has also assumed corporate governance responsibilities. He is on the board of directors of Manulife Financial, whose Canadian division is located nearby, Kitchener-Waterloo, and on the board of Vancouver International Airport. He also advises other firms on the promotion of their interests in Asia. A few years ago... Roland, you should be not only, I hope, uh, interested, but also to some extent perhaps even entertained a bit. All right, believe it or not, at some point the, uh, the title is going to show up. Actually, what I thought, uh, what I, thought I would do is... Um, I want to weave together a series of ideas. I, I ended up spending about 25 years in, uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, two-thirds of that in Japan, 17 years in Japan, but also, as, as you heard, uh, uh, in China and India. I was also in, uh, in Indochina, and all the way in Western Turkey, uh, in, uh, in Western Asia and Turkey. So what I thought I'd do is I'd weave together a set of ideas uh, that um, underpin my view that to understand uh, today's Asia, it's essential uh, to have notions that are both historical and uh, contemporary. I thought that what I should, uh, as I said, uh, was to weave a few of these ideas together, and we're going to be operating, obviously, given the time constraints and everything else, and the purposes of the evening, at a pretty high uh, level of abstraction, perhaps, uh, 30,000 feet. Uh, but what we're going to do this, we're going to do this in, in uh, Chinese airplanes and uh, Indian airplanes, uh, uh, the objective being to provide you as much as I can the perspective of, of the world in Asia from, uh, from uh, the region. Um, I'm going to talk about modern Asia, but um, uh, modern Asia is not just uh, modern. Um, the countries in today's Asian states draw important parts of their dynamism from an ever-present, uh, ever-vibrant and relevant past. Okay, now we'll see if this works. There we are. Um, we're Canadians, and we tend to see history as a pretty well a linear process. The past provides a social and technological impetus, but one that's largely irrelevant to the challenge of designing the next big thing. Can you think of how many Canadian prime ministers, for example, have publicly thought, you know, what would, about public policy issues, you know, what, what would John A. do about this? Uh, or how many of us think in those terms? We don't. But in, uh, in Asia, it is... Uh, the fact that the uh, past, both recent and distant, is much more alive. It's something to draw upon in order to, to take control and to design the future. Now, as everywhere else on the planet, uh, there are large countries in Asia and small ones, and they each have their own histories and social systems and, and perspectives. But the t larger ones, as again everywhere else in the world, tend to exercise a much more gravitational pull. Because of their historical depth, the dimensions of their territories, and the absolute size of their populations, China and India have at various times exercised immense political and cultural influences well beyond their political space, indeed on supracontinental basis. Their 21st century potential, based on today's geography, demographics, and economic growth, will necessarily echo some of that past at home 
and uh, beyond their region. Now, ironically, uh, in order to address the Far East in those terms, I really have to start with, so to speak, the Far West. Uh, and we have to do this uh, because essentially from the age of exploration uh, to the first half of the 20th century, the broad lines and much of the plumbing of global power and its distribution were shaped uh, by the West. They were designed to meet uh, the West's needs and uh, our priorities. During the 18th, 19th, and first half of the 20th century, Western powers exercised extensive authority in, over China, parts of, Indonesia, parts of uh, Indochina, um, uh, parts of Southeast Asia. These societies were essentially governed from Paris and London and Amsterdam and Lisbon and Washington. In the process, and to serve their ends, these powers imposed many political, military, technological, legal, commercial, bureaucratic methods and institutions that were fundamentally foreign uh, to these societies. In many cases, these impositions were in direct and even offensive conflict uh, with prevailing social and political norms. Borders were redrawn to facilitate colonial uh, control and military priorities. Think of the French in Indochina. Kingdoms were overthrown or subordinated uh, by, uh, uh, to imposed elites. Uh, this is the case of the Dutch, for example, in, Indo in Indonesia. Local agricultural economies were forced to produce for distant metropolitan markets uh, instead of meeting local needs, sometimes leading to famines. British India in the 1940s had the Great Bengali Famine, uh, which may have led to the death of four million people under British rule. Long-held religious beliefs were challenged by alien creeds, uh, primarily Christianity. Organic urban communities were torn apart to make way for geometric city centers. And this was happening uh, literally all over uh, Asia. Now try to imagine what it would have been like to have been uh, this Qing Mandarin uh, official, or perhaps an educator in the final years of the 19th century, witnessing the slow motion collapse of the Qing uh, uh, dynasty, in the, in the face of this onslaught of westernization and military power. Almost every major foundation of Chinese thought and institutions were proving to be inadequate to counter the West or meet the evolving needs of the Chinese people. A 2,000-year-old governance uh, system, an imperial system, uh, uh, could not meet the challenges of the period. Traditional military strategy, tactics, supply systems, leadership uh, could not counter the West's power. A 1,200-year-old uh, elite educational system based on Confucianism had to be abandoned. The foundations of Chinese science, astronomy, chemistry, physics, even medicine, had to be replaced with Western rationalism and the modern scientific method. Confucian value systems were fundamentally challenged by modern notions of political order and social equality, including for women, and equal rights before the law. Now, if you were an intellectual or a leader uh, facing all of this, how would you respond? Well, um, the Japanese, uh, for example, undertook a massive redesign of their governance, uh, uh, their education system, their military uh, along uh, Western lines, and they went beyond that, uh, uh, trying to better imperial powers by becoming imperialists themselves, eventually occupying and then annexing Korea, uh, Taiwan, initially northern China, uh, and ultimately about one-third of continental China, and then they went so far as to attack the United States. Well, we all know how that particular uh, experience ended. Um, Mao Zedong also borrowed from the West. Uh, he borrowed Marxism-Leninism uh, and uh, transformed it for Chinese purposes, uh, but his revolution required the obliteration of Chinese culture. And the Chinese traditional, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, uh, Chinese great cultural uh, revolution of the 1960s and 70s were that as an objective. If you go to Beijing today, you don't see any of the re results of that uh, experiment. Every Asian civilization faced the same kinds of challenges, attempting to adapt to the essence of their societies and value systems on the one hand, with Western technology and economic uh, development on the other. Over time, uh, they also sought to meet and ultimately achieve an equal footing with the countries 
of the developed West. For example, in artistic terms, that's what you're looking at, they sought to combine Eastern and Western aesthetics, such as uh, you see in this New York apartment of Lady Aiko, who's a well-known Japanese, uh, Japanese uh, artist. And indeed, by now, in the 21st century, this amalgamation has largely been achieved, a set of parallel stories of adoption and adaptation. It's been going on for a century, but it has reached a dramatic crescendo as China and India progressively achieve their national objectives. Now, we in the West have never had to face such civilizational existential transformation. Of course, we've had revolutions, you know, famously in France and in Russia, in the United States, not in Canada, where we have peace, order, and good government, thanks to CG and University of Waterloo and, and others. Uh, we've had, of course, a succession of murderous and destructive wars. Uh, there have been massive transformations, such as uh, the Industrial Revolution. But we've uh, rarely been forced to deny and overthrow whole systems of philosophy, ethics, governance, education, social organization, science, uh, technology, as was the case forced upon them by time and circumstance uh, in Asia. In geopolitical terms, the era, uh, the era was determined uh, by outside powers, largely the British Navy, and then following uh, World War II, the United States uh, Navy. To somewhat similar effect, Asia submitted to the global economic security system designed at Bretton Woods. However, um, Western dominance and control also contained within it the dynamic of its own progressive replacement. In other words, the Western order was ultimately beneficial not only to the West, but to Asia as well. For all of the injustices and injury uh, that Western powers brought upon Asian societies, these injustices are largely unknown to the vast majority of Westerners and largely unforgettable uh, to vast swaths of people in Asia. The West also provided uh, Asia with the tools that Asian societies have been able to add to their own toolkits to begin to affect changes of their own making in redesigning the world which we, our children and their children, will increasingly inhabit. Uh, now these tools are ones that come immediately to mind, market economy, modern science and technology, pragmatism uh, over ideology, meritocracy over hierarchy, rule of law over authoritarianism, public education for uh, the masses. Now, not all countries have accepted these in identical ways, but they've all adapted to uh, some extent. The result is that for the last 50 years in particular, we've been living a transformative era, one that is allowing the resurgence not only of once powerful, once dominant economies, but of what are powerful and proud civilizations. The West has won uh, in important ways in Asia, no country except North Korea contests the fundamental workings of the market economy, uh, even as they adjust the plumbing to meet their own ends. Many have become modern democracies. However, it's equal. While I was still at York, he received an honorary doctorate from the Schulich School of Business, and he maintains active involvement in both the Asia Pacific Foundation and the Institute of Asian Research at UBC. So much for the official biographical note. Let me add a few personal comments. I've known Joseph for about 25 years. During those years, I engaged him on issues ranging from Middle East politics to trade and development issues, and of course, the Asia Pacific. I often came as a supplicant from the university world, asking for advice or access or financial support for research initiatives. He was always generous, Sometimes patient, but never too patient, and never without insight and well-informed suggestions. Most attractive, he was an example of someone who, through, through deep study, acute observation, intense personal experience, and hard work, offered remarkably astute analysis and observations, along with carefully considered opinion. More to the point, he was prepared to share that knowledge and wisdom with his colleagues, both inside as well as outside government. And he always was candidly honest 
Many of us benefited from Joseph's interest and support in our work. I had the good fortune to visit China and Japan a number of times, a few of those when Joseph Caron was our ambassador. Not only was he personally interested in my visit and the visit of my colleagues, he always made himself available and he would host small events with his own staff along with local academics and the occasional government official so that I could have the opportunity to learn from them. He was genuinely interested in not just policy and process, but in the world of ideas, including perspectives that might challenge his own, or at least those of the then government of Canada. His multiple assignments in Japan, his command of the Japanese language, of its history and its culture, and his commitment to Canada-Japan relations led Meiji University to bestow on him an honorary doctorate, a rather unusual recognition of a serving ambassador. And whether in Beijing, Tokyo, or Delhi, those of us who needed to be in touch with him always knew that be it, he'd be at his desk at 5 a.m. his local time, reading the international as well as local national press, usually in the language of the country, and catching up on world affairs, never far from email, phone, or Skype. It is truly a great pleasure to have Joseph with us and to invite him to address us this evening. Joseph, come on. Thank you, David. Uh, well, thank you, David, for this very generous um, introduction. I think it's also the longest I've ever received, so this is, so this is great. Um, we all know that uh, Montreal is playing uh, New York tonight, and uh, so I'm, uh, I'm amazed that you're all so brave as to come out here, and therefore I, I thought what I would do, given the sacrifice of the time, is I'd spend the next hour talking about uh, Chinese interest rates and the efforts to liberalize them. <laughs> But then I thought, uh, well, maybe that's not such a great idea. Uh, it's after 7 o'clock after.